First off, I'd like to welcome you to our COIL Conversations for uh, December 2014. This is our last COIL sponsored event for the year. And we've had a very full year, very busy year. And I'm in, in particularly excited to uh, introduce you to Andrew Smith this morning. Our morning, Andrew's uh, late afternoon there. Uh, Andrew's in Dunstable, UK. Uh, and Andrew is a uh, lecturer in Cisco Networking. And he's the faculty of the Maths, Computing, and Technology for the Open University of the United Kingdom, UK. Uh, I first met Andrew in September, I want to say, at a conference for the Association of Learning Technologies uh, in Warwick, uh, UK. And uh, what I was fascinated by when Andrew did his session was how he used a technology that we all know as Twitter as a way to actually teach and deliver his course. And he was sharing with us the pros and cons and, and adjustments he had to make. And I, I thought it was quite brave, actually, to, uh, to jump in with a, a technology like that, which, we, as we all know, has limitations, but also has some advantages. And I thought Andrew was very crafty in how he constructed the learning environment to serve his students. So what I've asked Andrew to do this morning is to share with us uh, his platform, his design, some of his experiences, uh, the pros and cons. And uh, we'll do that for about 30 minutes. And, and, uh, and then we'll follow up with some questions and answers as we explore uh, teaching online through Twitter. So Andrew, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. OK, Larry, thank you very much. And as I say, good morning to all of you in Pennsylvania. And it is a sort of cold winter afternoon here in the UK. You'll probably see sort of from my window the light will get dim soon but you'll you'll be quite used to um sort of my british accent and my british euphemisms about weather if you've got any questions at any time do please put them in the chat and if there's any englishisms you don't understand tough look them up you're <laughs> you're going to have to get used to them um, just as a practical introduction, thanks Larry for that good summary. Yes, I am a lecturer in networking. I do a lot of work around developing curriculum here in the UK. And my main area is actually network simulation and security. But I've become fascinated over the years by how I can use social media as a way of engaging and reaching my students. Um, Partly because at the Open University, we are entirely a distance learning university. And typically, we, as a whole university, have around 180 to 250,000 students studying with us at any given moment. And my program has a reasonable subset of that um, large community. If you want to tweet me at any time, I am automatically tweeting at the moment. So if you find me as Terak Nor on Twitter, you will see that I've been tweeting PSU Coil already, and I will still continue to tweet, even though that I am not touching Twitter physically at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, some practicalities: we have around six to eight hundred students every year studying on our Cisco module, and we. Um, have reached quite a large number since we started teaching this program in 2005. So come next year, we will be 10 years old. And 5,000 students at the Open University, that is an average number. So the Cisco Network and Academy program, and I know there's plenty of Cisco Network and Academies around in Pennsylvania, there'll be a lot of colleges and universities teaching this that will give their left eye for this kind of numbers. And we're very fortunate because we're able to reach the unreachable and reach students that physically cannot turn up to colleges or physically cannot commit the time to um, study a week-by-week -week, um, study program at a local centre. And because of that, I've actually been doing this social media activity since 2013, partly because I spent some time exploring how we could actually make good use of it and not turn it into a noisy, pointless marketing campaign. So my idea, the original idea, is why can't we get our subjects to leak out onto the internet? You, at your institution, you have subjects that work as contained 
modules that will start um, for one week, last for 15 weeks, finish at the end of the semester, and then start again either the following semester or later in the year. And it tends to be a contained experience. We're no different in distance learning. We start a module in October, it'll finish in July, it'll run for nine months, um, reach a large number of students. But there's nothing leaky about it. Nobody can see what's happening on the outside, out there in the internet. So the question I ask myself is, what would the benefits be if I use social media to reinforce our teaching and use it to enable, to enhance our pedagogic as well as organization profile what would be the benefit of people seeing our teaching taking place and what would be the benefit to our students now um, I don't know if you have the phrase skin flint over in the United States but I don't like spending money and I wanted to find something that was free and I didn't have to develop a whole platform for my students to use and also the challenge I have nowadays is I can't go around to people and say, oh, you must use an iPhone or you must use Android, you must use the Firefox browser or you must be on a Mac or you must be on Linux or you must be using Microsoft. I want something that I can deliver and I don't care what you use. So some of you I've noticed have already been tweeting me. You could be on Apple um, Microsoft, Dell, or Hewlett Packard technology used in Linux, Android, or whatever. I don't want to worry about that. And I want to be able to deliver something that you can choose your software and you choose your platform. And um, out there, I know that developers have already spent thousands of hours and organizations millions of bucks to make that investment and I just simply want to utilize it. So social media is great in that respect because that development has taken place and is still taking place and I can go anywhere now and use any system and I know I can access different social media accounts. So the inspiration, well I like to think it's in anyway is I'm, I'm using um, social media to enhance the teaching of our Cisco modules so I have a very set program it's a Cisco certified network and associate which is internationally popular there's around a million students worldwide doing this at any given moment and make sure it leaks out onto the internet so my students can benefit from this but if anybody else comes along they can have it as well. Why? Because it would be good for them. Why? Because it arrays our profile. Why? Because it might, it might encourage some students to consider us as a centre to come and do their learning in the future. And my methodology is I will deliver this as forms of knowledge nuggets. I'm limited by some social media platforms how much information I can get out. But I know that knowledge nuggets are always good in almost any education program as a form of reinforcement, even if it comes before, during, or after when a student is specifically studying something. So, liking the idea of free, I decided to use a range of platforms, partly to um, sort of see what the engagement would be, Partly also, I know that different people prefer different platforms at different times. Not everybody likes Twitter, not everybody likes Facebook. So we created a set of platforms and engaged with the student exactly the same way on all of them. I created a LinkedIn um, Open University Cisco group. It does what it says on the tin. Um, when I first did this, I had around 200 members. It has grown in the last um, six months to 340 members. And the really interesting thing is not only do I have students, I've picked up some actual professionals working in the industry in this space as well, who are Cisco CCNA and CCMP engineers, as well as now having a community of our Cisco alumni. That means that every time um, a comment or a 
update or a knowledge nugget goes out, occasionally I actually get feedback from the community and people sharing their experiences and their ideas as well. A form of reinforcement, a form of additional teaching that I don't need to ask anybody for. Instead, I just get that extra enhancement. Obviously, using Facebook as well, I found the fan page was the best way because I didn't have to approve membership. When I started, we had around 90 members. We now have around 190 and growing. But we also have another group. Um, if any of you know anything about Cisco, there's some software called Packet Tracer. And I run a group of... Um, enthusiasts that have converted it to the Mac platform um, based on my simulation research but that has actually just enabled that community to sort of converse and communicate. Very eclectic. Um, I do find that occasional questions come in via this route but people tend to be a little bit more privacy shy here so LinkedIn I get a group of um, professionals who will share the experience as a comment. Here I tend to get a lot more people watch my posts and see my posts, which Facebook gives me incredibly good metrics for. Twitter, great platform. Um, highly recommended to everybody. And actually the lowest common denominator in how I've got to engage in this entire um, teaching and research project. At the moment I have around 250 followers on my OU Cisco um, Twitter feed. Um, I can see that many are from within the course community itself. And I, what I like about this is how it reaches by the retweets, favorites, and exchanges. And obviously, I've got a established Twitter community to engage with as well via Cisco Netacad. And on our bridge, I would say about 25 to 30 members of this community converse via this space. And if you actually look back at my at Terek Knorr Twitter feed at the moment, you'll see one student spotted what I'm doing with all of you in Pennsylvania today and has actually made a very positive comment about their experiences. Honest, I didn't pay them to say that. Um, they've just spotted it and they've just engaged with it as it's happened. Obviously, it's mid-afternoon here in the UK, so most people are still at work. So for what would be a quiet time in Twitter terms, it's yeah, it's elicited, elicited at least one very honest and giving response. I also use Google+. It's free. It's run by Google. It helps my search engine penetration. But um, it only has around 90 followers. It is the quietest of all. I have joked in the past, it is as almost as if the tumbleweed could be seen passing through this platform. But what I do like about Google Plus is I can feed the feed into a RSS uh, feed, which means then I can actually push this straight into my internal Moodle site. The Open University, like a lot of universities, are heavy users of the Moodle platform, which is unavailable to the public community. But I can do all of this work in the public space, and then I can shunt this public work straight into an RSS reader that is within our module site at the Open University. So even if students choose not to participate within the social media space, which is entirely their right, after all I've got about 400 students at this precise moment studying, they still have free access to all the information and knowledge nuggets that are coming through this platform. So they can choose to either have the RSS feed or they can choose just to view it every time they visit our module site as well, which I see personally as a win double situation. So I'm giving this to everybody, but I'm not excluding my students who do not want to participate in this either. And I have links and blog articles in with this as well. I am a reasonably prolific blogger, and it has helped 
sort of share some ideas. It's helped inform the community as well, and it's helped people understand outside a bit more depth about what we're doing. And the nice thing about platforms like WordPress or Blogger, which is the one I prefer to use, is it gives that um, extra dimension to the work you're doing. So if you are teaching and you're teaching within an enclosed space, a lot of your content is proprietary. No, you do not want to share it. But there's nothing wrong with putting little bits of knowledge out there for the whole community to see because that draws them more towards the teaching that you are delivering, at least in the future. I'm also a heavy user of the bit.ly URL shortening platform. Form, and I have created deliberate short URLs. You can customize them, you can craft them. So I do have the OU Cisco shortening, I have the OU Cisco T216, which is our course code shortening, and you can edit those and update those. And that way then, I don't have to convey a really long, meaningless URL. I can give them a nice, short, easy to remember URL that fits into a Twitter or a Facebook or on any other platform communication. And I've deliberately then used that for occasional course promotion as well. So I will output during a week many, many, many um, knowledge, academic related um, bits of social media information. But every couple of weeks, I will put out one or two pieces of information just saying, we are the Open University, and this is the courses that we present. So I'm yeah, getting a little bit of traction as well as understanding about what we do. And the trick is, is we've worked out how to string this all together. So whilst all the platforms are free, some of you may have come across Hootsuite, and Hootsuite has an automatic scheduling tool that if you pay $9.99 a month, and honestly, I'm getting no commission here, I can pump into Hootsuite a CSV of all my tweets. So this afternoon, the automatic tweets I'm doing, I just quickly generated a CSV this morning of probably about eight to 10 updates, put the date and the time I wanted them, and then just pushed it straight into the Hootsuite platform. And I'm pushing it out on a Twitter feed at the moment. But I'm outputting that on each of the platforms at regular intervals. And I've got a benefit then that I don't have to sit every day and tweet something. I plan these tweets far in advance. I know my curriculum and I know how it feeds. And the beauty then is I can get that to generate into any platform at any time on any subject for any course, anyhow, any way I would like it, if that made sense. So, I use different methods of engagement, and I've already mentioned the CSVs, and the power of this is we all know our study curriculum. So the Cisco curriculum is a set curriculum. I know on week one in October what subject my students should be reading, and I know the sequence of the chapters, sequence of the materials. As you know, in your study calendars, which week you're going to be covering what subject, and relevant content around that subject. Now, in distance learning, um, we'll say on week one, students should be doing chapter one. On week 10, you could assume they're doing chapter 10. The reality is, by week 10, some students are ahead, some students are behind, some students are on track. And that really doesn't matter. So we just base on the principle that if they're getting the knowledge beforehand, it's introduction. During, that's reinforcement. After, it's a reminder. It still comes in use to the student, depending on where they are in the curriculum. We also give them weekly reminders, remind them what chapters are doing, remind them that an assignment is due, or that their day school physical face-to-face -face classes or tutorials when they're due. So we've got that automated advantage as well of engaging with the student's routine experience. And that's what we're putting that into the public space as well as all of that knowledge. And we do, as I've already said, 
remind people that we are the Open University, and we don't do any overt marketing. It's more that it's covert, it's subtle, and it's just that gentle reminder. If I did an update every day, I would drive people away. I feel that if doing updates once every one or two weeks is just a subtle, gentle, and fair way of dealing with the fact that I'm actually giving away a lot of information for free to um, the worldwide community as well. Also, the lovely thing about um, using these CSVs is I'm able to craft these updates. And I usually, for each block of the material, I will generate around 250 updates. So I sat down one day and just started reading the material, which I had to do anyway. Um, to make sure that I'm up to date with the, the sort of latest curriculum and I just put that content in and just made sure I edited it down to 140 characters. There are some affordances you cannot repeat. Um, the Twitter API rules do not allow you to repeat anything at all. The cheat is you just change one character, add a semicolon or a colon and you can do that. But that's not reasonable. We've generated around 900 updates because of this. The actual reality is I've probably, with my different CSVs, have around 1,100 different updates that I can reuse every year and amend every year. So I've got a date in my diary for early January to then just double check my next batch of updates and to then go and push those straight into the hoop suite system and the principle is I'm actually lazy by default and wonder why so many academics automate so little via social media and it was great the conference that Larry and I was at but so many people were telling us that they were just sitting there doing the updates themselves live on these social media platforms and I was wondering how they managed to get away with not having a nervous breakdown and doing it. Here we've got the tools, we can get the technology to do it for us and the great thing is then I've only got to do updates, personal updates, as and when rarely occasionally they are relevant. In anything, humour is wonderful. Do not fear memes, do not fear humour. Okay, for many of you, that slide might be technologically meaningless, but to a Cisco geek, they love it. And you must break it up occasionally with some humour or a bit of fun. Lecturers do it in class, why can't you do it online? And it's a good way, I've, I'm actually teaching them by that humour, and they all will agree that you must, you, know, you must always save before you reload a router. But actually using that famous Batman slapping Robin meme, which is a good way of getting across what would have been an otherwise mundane message. We do use a lot of the written word. There's a lot of technology. There's a lot of content. Um, there's a lot of knowledge to um, bring out in what I cover in my subject. But why can't I use images when appropriate, diagrams where um, required, and humour, um, yeah, as a gentle sprinkling of sugar on what could be an otherwise dry um, subject. Also, I like using um, YouTube. In every subject, there is YouTube content. And you are academic curators and individuals that know your subjects very well. And again, I focused on humour, but actually I found a few extra um, videos describing the topics that I cover. And we just sort of um, to fill that in bit by bit. I don't give them videos every week. I give them videos on the subjects as and when they need that, because then that helps them. Um, with whatever subject they're covering. So if there isn't a video for it and we don't have time to make it, genuinely, we don't do it. Also, current affairs. Um, there are articles out there because I deal in network engineering and security. There is usually some attack or some problem or some issue. And at the moment, Sony's PlayStation 
network being hacked is something worth reporting on. And I do write articles for an academic newspaper. In fact, I believe it's just started in the United States as well. And I do use them as well. Or I use the articles of others. And if they're good and they get good engagement, I keep them. And I use them again in the future because some articles articles are worth coming back to um, in future teaching events as well. And I talk to them. And I'll talk to anybody on social media. Genuinely, most people don't bite on social media. I've had no trolling. I've had no real bullying issues. I've had no issues, really. But I've one or two people be fools on a couple of their comments, but there's difference between foolishness and real problems. And I do get questions coming sometimes about a course from students, sometimes about from individuals who just want to have their brain rubbed for them, answer them, but I tend to answer them in a way to get the rest of the community to join in as well. LinkedIn seemed to work the best. It was more professional and friendly. With Twitter, it was a bit more banter and humor but it was still um, a valid engagement. And you've got to be prepared to do that. So often, I mean, I have it all linked into this funny little pocket device called a telephone. And you know, I will get queries sometimes at odd times of day. Respond to them if they're worth responding to. Sometimes even just responding with a smiley face because the student's complaining about a problem they're having because it's such a difficult subject. Actually, it's really good. It's reassuring. And it's the kind of thing that they actually like because they know that they're not in it by themselves. What I have also found is in my design of the knowledge nuggets, a lot of them is straightforward, dry knowledge. But I do also put some open questions in there. Why do you think? What do you think? How does this type question? Getting their opinion or their ideas. And that will get a flurry of comments on different platforms as well. It's not just a case of putting out knowledge. It is also a case of asking the students question about why they think what is and they will depending on the question you will get engagement as well again doing too much of that um, it bore, yeah, bores people they become disengaged doing that occasionally they will throw in their uh, 10 penneth worth as they as we would say here and they will then you know share their own opinion as well. But what I am always prepared is to ditch posts if I don't think they had really positive engagement or reword or reuse them. Because often if they worked well last year when I did the pilot, they're going to work well again this year. And I'm finding you get slightly different audiences, but the reactions are quite similar each time. And also, don't be afraid to find your allies. A few posts, I was um, sneaky, and I asked a few colleagues to retweet and to reply, and that or reshare, and that that is not a bad thing. Here in the UK, we have a famous social media group called Mumsnet. It is famous because it's um, it's made the last two prime ministers pay attention to some issues. And Mumsnet started by one single individual creating a forum and then talking to herself for a couple of weeks on the forum and replying to herself under a pseudonym until people started joining in. Now, whether that's ethical or not is open to debate, but what she did do and created now a very, very popular and socially active group is create that engagement that is required and if you're starting something getting colleagues allies appropriate friends to join in appropriately and just generate that little bit of um, noise in order to get others then involved is quite useful and in the early days that helped help me out considerably so at the open university we often refer to ourselves at the OU is we are thinking already what next I've run this once. I am now on the second iteration in an action research style. 
I am looking to find more allies and engage the community. And I'm looking at how I can actually replicate this in different areas. With the Cisco networking, I have a very, let's say, static content that is used worldwide. But there are obviously other subjects out there we could teach this on. It doesn't have to be technological, like my field, but I am looking to sort of build up the community I've got and look to then replicate this experience in um, other communities. And I'm looking to do a deeper dive in the research of the impact of this in this presentation. I've already got an ethics review going through where I'm actually going to get the students to give me some qualitative as well as quantitative feedback on what they think or can see, you know, we can see that the impact is. But the sort of reality is for us at the Open University and my team working on this is that this has been a very, very positive experience where I can actually see that um, I am getting plenty of student engagement. And I can see from this afternoon my little sort of phone and my other computer with my Twitter feed on has been going silly with your sort of comments and other comments about yeah you know, how this engage and if I'm getting this within a 30 minute slot think how this is happening over nine months with a larger community that I've probably added up I'm reaching around six to seven hundred individuals at any given moment in the community of 400 students of which we've guessed that only around 20 percent of them are actually actively engaging in this so the question I have to ask myself is if only 20% are engaging, where are the other 600 coming from? And in the nicest sense, I don't care. I want them involved because now I've got that peripheral community that are helping my students and enabling me to leak my course out onto the internet to reach other people. So I'm going to shut up now. And um, I believe Larry and Brad can then open the mic to and the rest of you, and we can sort of take one question at a time while I sip my coffee. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Andrew. I really uh, appreciate that, and uh, it reminded me again of, um, of how uh, interesting and multiple, toward multiple outcomes your approach is. And I love the idea, and I, I think what got fired me up when I heard you in September, was this idea about engagement, 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 and, and using a variety of different tools and techniques, and not worrying too much about um, who the recipient is on the other end, uh, which I'm sure leads to the question, and you, you've addressed it a little bit, but I might ask you to reveal a little bit more. My thought would be that you would get all kinds of people coming out of the woodwork, uh, spammers, uh, you know, people who aren't wrapped too tightly, um, perhaps really aren't on topic, need to rant, and so forth. And you've said that that really hasn't been an issue. I mean, that's contrary to, I think, uh, what a lot of us would worry about. Uh, yeah, I mean, you've probably worked out I'm a, quite an ebullient character, and you've got to go a long way before you annoy me. Um, yeah, I would say I've had one or two foolish individuals, but that doesn't make them bad individuals. And they, they you know, choked around or, um, yeah, sort of jerked around. I don't know what the right phrase is. But on the whole, it's been very professional, polite, informed, and a lot of people have actually wanted this. Occasionally, individuals have had a moan, and occasionally they've been really pleased to get it off their chest. And then... Once they've been reassured, it's been fine because they're usually moaning about the assignments. And I haven't been to a university or a college yet where students haven't had to moan about assignments. <laughs> yeah, interesting. That, uh, uh, I, I want to make sure we open up uh, opportunity for others to, to put in. So just as a reminder, we have a group here in the room. Uh, and we've got an open mic for that, but we also have folks online. So if you wish, you could uh, type your question into the uh, chat box there, and uh, we can follow up with that, Andrew, and other other thoughts. That's um, right. I mean, go for it. Yeah, let me see if uh, in the room here anyone has questions or, or comments. Uh, I know Haley. I'm going to point to you. Uh, Haley is thinking about our uh, 
uh, in particular, our social media use within our organization uh, called COIL, our Center for Online Innovation and Learning, and um, looking at how we might be using a variety of these techniques to reach out. What I love about your approach here is that you're not, you're not limiting the audience. You're actually broadening the audience and welcoming uh, participation with uh, and getting a varied results, and I uh, I don't know, Hayley, if you think about how that might play out in our group or the kinds of tools that we might use. Any thoughts? Um, yeah, well, I think it was really interesting to hear even some of what you said others have experienced, especially on Twitter, that's where we've been really focusing, but um, just hearing from the thoughts that you had were sometimes you're just having a conversation with yourself until others kind of have yeah. And I think that that's a lot of what you have to be starting out, and that people can easily get discouraged, but soon enough you can have a solid conversation and write a lot. But it's sort of like um, spinning the engine there for a while until, until the, the flywheel gets caught, until you actually have right, yeah. a group join you. I, I kind of thought that was fun, too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's like, a, it's like a coffee shop. Nobody will go into the coffee shop if it's empty. But as soon as you see some customers in there, even if the customers are your family buying coffee, then yeah. there is that, yeah, sort of... It's just human nature. We don't like going into unknown places, but it builds up. And, yeah, I mean, now and again, I, I still see, yeah, it's quiet for a while. I will do a couple of things just to gently nudge it along, but I don't find I need to do much now. Hi, Andrew. I'd like, to, I'd like to hear more about how you're analyzing the student experience. What are the evaluation tools that you're using and how you're evaluating that experience? Okay, I've got two sets of tools at my disposal. One, I did an internal questionnaire within the module and asked them last year how many of them had used social media, how many of them would use social media, and did they see any benefit? And I got a reasonable set of analysis from that. The other tools I use is that the different platforms available have all got their own analysis tools built in. So LinkedIn and um, Twitter and Facebook, I can analyze them. And I can actually analyze them via Hootsuite. So I know how, how many people something to reach. There's some weeks. I might only have a community of 250, um, uh, what's the phrase, followers, sorry, followers on Twitter. But I know that some tweets have reached 2,000 people um, because Twitter will quite happily tell me all that sort of information. From the academic research and impact at the moment, I, would, I, I can tell by, uh, yeah, by only by self-selection of participants that I'm getting maybe 20% of my students outside on the social media. I cannot tell how many are using RSS. But on the sort of whole community, I can tell that often my updates are reaching that 600 individuals, but could be yeah, in the, on occasions, because of retweet and impact, pushing to 2,000 plus. And who they are, I honestly don't know. And who, and also who they are, should I care? I don't think I should, actually. I'm more interested in making that leaky nature and reaching that wider community. And the fact that I have only 400 students studying this at a time, and I'm reaching a greater number of that than that, is my idea that we are having a greater impact than the actual module is. Thank you. And I'm wondering how much um, from offering to offering, that is from, from one, uh, you call them presentations, we might call them a course, but from one presentation to the next, are you getting individual staying with you? So say I've completed in one presentation and now you started a new one. Are you getting a community to go with you and sort of build as time goes on? 
or do you find your participants sort of you know dropping off once they've completed a certain presentation? No, I find it's quite cumulative. Um, I am picking up alumni, and I'm actually picking up some alumni who are then acting as um, self-appointed, in a positive sense, guides to the new students. So on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, that is definitely happening. Um, it, yeah, there are, yeah, it, if I was to analyze it deeply, which I must admit I have not, I probably could work out that I am losing a percentage as well. But it, it is mainly gain over loss. Yes. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, if I understand it correctly, you're engaging your students in a single assignment across multiple different uh, social media platforms. I'm wondering if your students have talked about the sort of cohesion of the community or, or each of these networks sort of ending up being sort of split splinters of communities or do the students have a sense that even though they're using a bunch of different social networks, that they are part of a cohesive community responding to a topic. Well, well, welcome to a purely distance learning university where cohesion of community is our biggest problem ever and has been the case for the last 45 years. So your idea of cohesion of community and our idea of cohesion are probably two quite different things. Um, and with that, we've all we solved the problem either with our residential school experience years ago, or with the use of forums, online forums from the, the mid 1990s. Um, so, in the social media world, what we find is that we have a subset of students that want to go out into the social media space. How they feel about it. I don't know because we already have a disparate community of learners at the Open University and what they see and it's quite important to understand in the UK the Open University is a major brand so people say with pride that they've studied at the Open University now I would say that because I work for the Open University but I will say anecdotally I have to be careful when I go out in public and people say who do you work for and as soon as I mention who I work for the chances are they've either studied worked for or know somebody who is studying at the Open University and there is a big a much larger sense of community and belonging within the Open University. So back to your question, do the students have a sense of cohesion across these multiple platforms? No, not in the way you're thinking. But anything that associates with the Open University as a identity, as a brand, automatically brings a sense of cohesion in the United Kingdom. But also, Cisco Systems, sorry, can I have a show of hands as somebody quickly flips the camera around? How many of you know of the Cisco Networking Academy and have ever encountered it? No? I would say you are probably aware of it. We're aware of it. I don't know that anyone in the room has completed it. Is it, is no. it right? It's a great thing, and it comes from San Francisco originally, okay? And in the United States now, you are, as a country, only 19% of a worldwide program that started in your part of the world. There is a massive international community of a million people studying in Cisco, in the Cisco community, and we are a community. Um, the UK is a yeah, it's a principal part. It's not the largest part, by all means. But there is a community in the UK. There's a community in Europe. There's a community in Asia and so on. So what I've done is tap into a very small subset of a much larger community. And I know that others around the world have found us as part of that community as well. So I think we're a community within a community within a community. And because of that, that cross-platform cohesion is probably not the kind of question that means anything to us, 
but it's probably very important if you're starting something completely new and um, sort of fresh out the box for the very first time. So the trick would be, where is the other community and how you would engage them? Yeah, that was a long yeah. answer for the question. It's a good one. Thank you. And we have sort of a follow-up question, I think, kind of in that vein from uh, one of our colleagues online, Kyle. We're going to ask Kyle to ask his question live. Okay. I'm reading out the question at the moment. Okay. Sure. Well, I'm going to modify it. I'll, uh, I'll modify it a little bit as we go. Uh, first of all, as you can see, I'm old. And so maybe my, my comment is, is age-based. My, my beard trimming gives away how gray I am. But. All right. So it seems to me there would be a lot of very meaty issues that you'd want to deal with that can't really be handled in short bursts. I find it frustrating to have to write uh, in X characters. So I was wondering if you had you looked at tools, and I probably should have put this, another tool in my text-based question, but there are things like blogs, and you use blogs, where you might have real conversations uh, with back and forth and you know, see comments and everything. Just use the social media, Twitters and other things, just to bring people in to say, wow, there's a good conversation on this going on over here. And I know you do a, use a blog, but have you seen tools like piazza.com? That's P-I-A-Z-Z-A. -Z -Z -A. It's designed for, supporting, uh, for students to support each other and to build community. And basically, I'll type that in. Piazza.com. I don't know if I've got um, it right. Did they get it right? Oh, Brad, Brad beat to it. So the idea is that, that every question is a wiki, and every answer is a wiki. And so students can pose questions, and then other students can modify them, and they can support each other, and instructors can check in. So it seems to me like, you know, maybe tools like that, again, combined with Twitter, because I, I like what you said about getting you know, sort of spilling out into the social media world and the internet. I really leaking out. I like that concept a lot. But it seems like if you had something, you know, significant going on and then use the uh, leaking to bring more people in. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And I haven't come across Piazza and I will look at it. I mean, the other reality is we internally within the Open University, we have all of this. Not in that format, but we have our own extensive forums and wiki spaces that our paying students have that experience. And they have the curriculum, they have the content, we have the support. So the, the part of the deliberate ploy is I'm trying to create a freemium slightly and give away so much in order mm. to yeah sort of leave sort of litter 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 internet fairy dust of knowledge okay. across. And you, you can nick that phrase, so I just made I it like up. That. I think it's great. <laughs> you know? In fact, if I were going to tweet something, it would be the Internet fairy dust of knowledge or whatever you just said. Yeah. Anyway, so you, you can't steal it. It's my copyright, but it's obviously a tribute to <laughs> me. <laughs> but it is, yeah, joke, joking aside, it is, for me, it's about creating that, um, yeah, that sprinkling of dust and about getting the knowledge out there and just a conversation. Because in academia, in face-to-face, -face, we have our lectures, and then there is the canteen coffee shop conversation. And the students do talk a little bit about the topic after the lesson. Not, not often in the way we would like, maybe. How bad was that lecture? But when they're trying to get their head around something, they have that conversation. And I'm just trying to get that conversation in my distance learning world out there but also to create an impact and an awareness and to reach people that I might not have been able to reach so I do find Piazza works but I find that the real conversations take place in my LinkedIn group and LinkedIn allows for good conversations to take place and I might have only created 140 characters of nugget but then that's when the um, participant bounce around other pieces of information and some threads have got very long in the conversation as people have added new things to that blogs yep I get com comments and conversations um, Twitter it's very momentary 
but you, if you can follow a Twitter feed, you can see little conversations taking place. And I think they are all good, valid conversations. And sometimes I believe that what I'm doing is enabling eureka moments where I will share something and a student will suddenly go, aha, and then reply with an extra bit of information. Mm -hmm. Or for other people, it's that ah moment where they will go, blah, 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 ah, and by the way. And all of that just adds to that rich tapestry of yeah. learning via distance and hopefully creates that slight yeah, variation of that canteen conversation where students will have that chat on the way to classes or over a cup of coffee and suddenly there's just that moment where hopefully the penny drops and I could have my students or these individuals anywhere and if pennies are dropping then I am a happy lecturer. Yeah, in a way I guess it's also like in a in the audience, people will turn to somebody else and say, "Ooh, that was really good. I'm going to try that when we get home." You know, yeah. and it's yeah. it's now I'm going to then they're back in. So, yeah, and sometimes sometimes it's more of a case of yeah, I'll put something, and yeah, people are going, "What does that mean?" And I go, "Oh, that's so and so," and they go off and they do that because, like it or not, as academics, um. We're not the best teachers in the world, and not everybody gets everything we tell them. And I, you know, I, I've learned to live with that problem, and learned to encourage students to help each other's each other out as well. And you know, there's a little bit, you know, you know, sort of um, social constructivism going on here. And yeah, if the students go away and then self reinforce or self learn, but based on the foundations I've given them, then I know, I know that learning is taking place, but it's by the means that the student has decided all I've done is hopefully enable it. Great. Thank you. My pleasure. So, Andrew, I, I've got uh, maybe a, a wrap-up question for you. Um, if you were to reconstruct this space, let's say you were starting over again, you have all of these tools, would you do anything differently, or would you take the same approach? It, because it seems to me this has become sort of an organic process of you sort of adding one on here and then you know using Hootsuite to connect some dots and such. Would you reconstruct it in any other way if you were to start from scratch? That's a big question. Um, no is the short answer. Uh, I wouldn't reassemble it, um, but I, I'm always looking for new, yeah, new easier ways of reaching people. Um, mm -hmm. I originally didn't plan to use Google Plus at all um, because there was a way of generating RSS feeds from Twitter, but the nice people at Twitter stopped that. So I had a um, I went for a set of rude words, tried tried my full Anglo-Saxon vocabulary, and then had to search the web for another way to fix the problem. Hence, how I came up with the Google Plus platform. Would I would I do anything differently? No, because it's adaptive, and it really yeah, it is it is organic, and. The, the, the beauty of the way this works is with post web 2.0 technologies if there's a new and exciting platform come out and let's say Ello, which is the new one that everybody wants to join at the moment mm -hmm. um, becomes actually useful then I may engage with that because again I don't want to tell the student what platform to use I just want to provide the base information and just push it out so the one thing I am keen to discover is if there was a completely new topic on a subject that I knew nothing about, then I would like to know is how could we um, go about developing that from scratch based on what I've um, learned so far. And that would be more fascinating to me. Very good. I think the way that you uh, addressed Kyle's question as well is, is really critical, and that is um, you know, using each of these medium for what they do and not being restricted to 
you know, the 140 characters of Twitter. You find another way to go about getting larger messages out. So you're really capitalizing on, on the capabilities of each of these technologies, which I think is, is uh, something I'm, I'm challenged to do. And I like yeah. the way that you sort of organized and made it more efficient for yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am one individual with a large program. And um, I, I've got to think of efficient ways of making this work. Otherwise, I, you know, I have created my own rock, rod from my own back. And the, be the beauty of this is it pretty much looks after itself for, um, most of the time, which is yeah, to, to, to us the greatest benefit. Um, but yeah, in the future, I may sit. Yeah, you know, I do want to create content for some of my other courses, and I've got to think of other ways of pushing that out because Hootsuite, Twitter, and other platforms do set limitations on the number of outputs I can push out at one time. There are limitations on how often as well. Fortunately, the limit the the quickest I can do it is once every five minutes. And I can get away with this over a couple of hours, but over a um, nine-month period, I will drive everybody mad. Right, right. Um, the other affordance is per platform, Hootsuite stops you from putting out more than 350 updates at a time. Unfortunately, I can ma mitigate that quite easily. But, yeah, there are, yeah, if I wanted to say over a seven-day period, flood the internet with um, my wonderful musings the answer is no that's not going to happen thankfully but there yeah there are probably some realities and some limitations that we have got to think of as well the other beauty is time zone is not a problem and time of study is not a problem that people will get what they want when they want to get it right very good well Andrew I wanted to say thank you uh, from the COIL community from Penn State for taking of your time today and sharing with us your experiences in uh, maximizing really the uh, social media networks and integrating those into your educational process. I found it again very helpful as I did back in September. Um, I'll, I'll say thank you from our organization and I wish you well for a nice holiday break which I have a sense you deserve coming up here very shortly. So um, best wishes yeah. to you. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you, Andrew. Before you go, I've just seen a tweet saying, do I use TweetDeck as well? Oh, and yeah. the answer is, not anymore. TweetDeck isn't actually that good a platform for this. Hootsuite, you can automate far in advance. TweetDeck, you've got to do individual updates, which is um, quite plain painful. Very good. Thank you for handling that very last question. Okay. Andrew, we wish you well, and we thank you again for your time. Okay, goodbye. Okay, bye-bye.